Well, welcome back to uh, Senate Doctor Show. I'm uh, John Barrasso, an orthopedic surgeon from Casper, Wyoming, also uh, a, a United States Senate orthopedic surgeon and United States Senator. And I'm joined with uh, by Tom Coburn, who uh, is from Oklahoma, a physician as well uh, as a uh, uh, as a United States Senator. And this has been a terrific show. Thanks so much for, for coming on. Glad to on. join you on it. You know, we've had a lot of emails, and just about everyone talks about the fact that healthcare is such a personal decision, how it affects everyone personally. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's so important that we get it right. This is this is something that's going to affect everybody in this country, and and I don't know anybody up here in the Senate that doesn't want to solve the key problems. We want to make sure everybody has access, control the costs so we don't bankrupt our kids, make sure nothing gets in between you and your doctor uh, and choice. And and so the the premise that's out there sometimes is that we don't believe that and. The fact is, as two physicians, we believe it, and we believe the rest of our colleagues believe that, no matter what party they're from. But the f question is, is how do you do it, and how fast do you do it, and you do it in a way that actually solves the problem. And I think that's one of the important uh, problems and, and difficulties ahead of us, is because if we get it right, great. If we get it wrong, uh, it's a disaster. Let's go right to the emails. We have an email coming in now, of course, from. Uh, Wyoming senators, could you please address in your broadcast how the Congress could create a viable health care solution that would permit the market rather than the government to cover the uninsured and or rein in health care costs without additional government spending? Thanks for your yeah. time and consideration. Hey, well, we've done it already. Uh, there's uh, nine of us now that are co-sponsoring a bill called the P Patient's Choice Act. It does exactly that. It creates refundable tax credits. It, it allows everybody to have health care. It doesn't raise taxes on anybody in the country. And actually, it's estimated just for the states to save them $980 billion the first 10 years on Medicaid costs. That's $980 billion that the states wouldn't have to spend on Medicaid that they could spend on other things or through tax reduction. Uh, the, the assumption underlying the question is, is we already spend twice as much as anybody else in the world per person on health care. We need better value out of health care. And the Patient's Choice Act, uh, 1099, as Senate Bill 1099, actually accomplishes that fact. And what I saw at home all weekend was people saying, you know, what's in it for me? Is my life going to be better or worse as a result of the bills? Because we had a lot of bills that have been introduced, but they're really only discussing a couple of them. So I think Well, the only ones that have been discussed, the ones that have actually been discussed, are the health committee that came through, and it's going to be about $1.6 trillion over the next 10 years when you, you account for it accurately. And people will lose the insurance that they have now in some instances. Uh, 36 million people will still not be covered. And uh, we will create a government-run program that ultimately will have a bureaucrat stand between you and your doctor or your choices about your health. We have a video coming in Okay. Now. Affordable health care for everyone. We all think everyone should be taken care of. Um, I'm a little concerned that we're rushing uh, with health care reform, that setting arbitrary deadlines without thoroughly considering all the options and all of the possible uh, unintended consequences from pushing things forward without carefully considering uh, what could happen uh, concerns me quite a bit. And I think that uh, things are uh, being steamrolled without uh, careful consideration, and that's a concern that I I have. Well, that's right. You know, we hear from people all the time saying, give us time to think about this. Let us see what's in the bill. Let us read it. Let us study it. You know, in Congress, they seem to rush things through. They did that with the, uh, with the stimulus package where they didn't let people leave home, leave, leave D.C. and go home until after the vote was taken. They did the same thing with cap and trade. And, you know, people in Wyoming want me to come home with a bill, read it, travel around the state, listen to what people have to say, and then come back and make decisions yeah. and vote and look for ways to improve it. There are lots of unintended consequences. Tom. Well, I think she, she said two things that are real important. Most Americans agree we can, we can, we can get this right for everybody. Uh, but how we get it and what does it cost is the important question. And so when somebody says an artificial deadline, you have to have it done by this, you have, the first question you have to ask is why? Uh, why, with the risk of getting it wrong, uh, should we do it? So it, it, it needs to be reasoned. It needs to be well thought out. We need the governor's input because a lot of what we're doing is markedly going to affect the tax rates in the states of this country, in ter especially in terms of the Medicaid expansion. So w we need everybody. In it. The other thing that we need is for everybody to recognize that the more government there is in it, 
the higher the taxes for they are they're are going to be for them even if we don't raise taxes specifically related to health care because we have twenty eight hundred dollars per family now cost shifted out of medicare and medicaid in other words what medicare and medicaid are paying doesn't pay for the bill by twenty eight hundred dollars per family right now so everybody in this country that has health insurance whether by your employer or you're struggling to do it yourself that twenty eight hundred dollars is coming out of your pocket either in lost wages or directly out of your pocket in terms of excess insurance costs now we want to hear from you if you'd like to email us we'd, we'd love to hear from you doctors at src.senate.gov uh, or you can go to youtube at www.youtube.com slash user slash senate doctor show uh, Facebook at uh, www.facebook.com slash Senate Doctor Show or Twitter at uh, www.twitter.com slash Senate Doctors. And uh, we have one of those questions right now. Let's see. Uh, I do not know a single person in favor of health care reform. In fact, it says it really seems that most people are against socialized medicine. So why is it that the Obama administration keeps trying to push this? Oh, and my question would be, doctors are going to have to take on more cases and patients to cover their expenses once socialized medicine is in effect. Uh, this also means an increase in liability. Indigent patients tend to sue more often, it says. So why don't we also switch to a loser pay system? If a patient sues his or her doctor and loses, this would mean that they would be responsible for the court costs incurred by both parties. I think that would keep people who really are just looking for a quick payoff to think twice before suing. Well, Tom? You know, we've practiced with colleagues over the years who I think order a number of tests uh, to protect themselves rather than get the patient. Oh, I, admit, I, I still practice. I practice on Monday mornings or at least try to when we don't get called back here early for vote. Uh, I think that is a significant question as nowhere in any of the bills that are going through that we have actually had through committee do we address li liability costs and, and defensive medicine. It co it's 8% of the cost of health care. 8% of the cost of your premiums every month now are associated with defensive medicine and the price of malpractice insurance in this country. Uh, th that comes out to about $200 billion a year. If we just had common sense uh, solutions in terms of the tort cases surrounding uh, medicine and health care, uh, we could cut that in half probably. We could save $100 billion. $100 billion would be a marked drop, uh, and yet that's not included in any of the proposals other than the ones that myself and two other colleagues uh, on our side of the aisle have offered. And one solution would be loser pays. That's sure, that's recommend. a great answer. Another one, I think Senator Health Renzi courts. had a proposal about even, even not even doing them everywhere, just kind of as a, what, a model study to look at the potential. Or given the states the ability to do that. Yeah. We have a video now coming in. Hey, Senators, I'd like to know how you intend to pay for it. In my household, when I have to buy something new, I have to find a way to pay for it. So how do you intend to pay for health care? Well, I'd, I'd give him two answers. Uh, we shouldn't have to pay for health care reform. Health care reform should cost less, not more. That's number one. And number two is he makes hard choices, and which means if we're going to pay for it, what we should do is re reduce some of the $350 billion a year in fraud, waste, and duplication that's strung across the federal government and use that. $350 billion a year comes out you know, to $3.5 trillion over 10 years. So even we could do the plan that they're trying to get through now and not raise anybody's taxes if we just do our job on oversight. And you know, actually, there's a study out. There's a book called *License to Steal*, mm -hmm. and it talks about all this fraud in, in Medicare. And so if you're if you're a drug dealer in Florida, it's actually they're moving into Medicare fraud. It's easier. It, it's, it's an, an easier, easier scam. And and you make more money. And if you get caught, the punishment is less. less. So, uh, yeah. you know, but yet the government doesn't seem to respond. And that's my grave concern well, when you get the government involved in this. It's important for listeners to know the. The improper payment rate, as reported by HHS, is $62 billion a year on Medicare. It, it's over $35 billion. That's as reported. The GAO says both those numbers are way underneath it. It's close to $150 billion. So $150 billion a year in fraud and, and improper payments with Medicare and Medicaid, what would make us think we can design another system that's not going to continue to have those same kind of problems? Uh, we have another email in now. Let's see. Should any health care reform plan include abortion coverage and funding for abortion services? Why not? Uh, what do you intend to do to ensure that taxpayer dollars? 
do not go to fund abortion services. And this is from uh, Molly Hannabrink, a correspondent for Fox News. How'd we let that one sneak in? <laughs> well, uh, they mm -hmm. were doing stories on that uh, all day yesterday, and I think this is a key well, question that a lot of people want to know the about. The bill that passed the health committee, John, actually subsidizes and will pay uh, for, take taxpayer money and pay for elective abortions for individuals. Uh, so the, the question is, we, we offered several amendments, Senator Hatch did, I offered amendment, uh, those were rejected 12-11 uh, uh, in the committee. Uh, so, so what that says is the policy is getting ready to be that your tax dollars will be used to fund abortions in this bill. Uh, if you want to get in touch with us, uh, www.twitter.com slash senate doctors, uh, facebook.com uh, slash senate doctor show, youtube.com senate doctor show, uh, or uh, email us uh, doctors at src.senate.gov. We want to hear from you. I think we have a video now, Tom. I don't really understand how uh, a, a government uh, plan is going to be quote unquote competition with private health care. Um, I mean, government has sort of infinite deep pockets, and you know, there's essentially no risk uh, except to the taxpayers. And yet, a third-party payer has, you know, they have to deal with all the usual risks that are accompanying uh, business. So, I, I just don't really understand how all these pieces come together. Well, it's very hard to understand how all the pieces come together. And uh, even today, on a, uh, the, the president had a conference call with, with a number of bloggers, and they asked him a specific question about the, the bill because he continues to say that uh, you know anyone will keep the plan can keep the plan that they want and keep the doctor that they want. And uh, this blogger said, "Well, what, what about these specific points?" And because uh, there's been an investors business daily yeah. editorial about the, the fact that insurance companies aren't going to be able to sell insurance after a certain date, and the president said, "You know, I'm not familiar with that part of the bill." And that's why I think we need to have everybody have a chance to take a look at the bill, take it home over the break, travel around, listen, because there are unintended consequences. These bills are very complicated. You're talking about a bill a thousand pages long uh, with lots of inter interrelated parts. And I mean, there's a lot of places where it said you shall do this, lots of new mandates. And I think that's the complicating factor. And people at home, certainly in Wyoming, want to know exactly what's in the bill before they, they can weigh in on it. The first thing they should know is there's 84 brand new federal government programs in the bill that passed the Help Committee. There's 220 times where we're going to allow the bureaucracy to set all the rules associated with all the demands in this bill. I want to go back really to his, his point. Is, as physicians, we're known, we know you don't treat symptoms. You try to get a diagnosis so you treat the disease. And what is happening in terms of health insurance is, is the premise by those in Washington that want a government or a run plan is that Medicare and Medicaid are efficient. But if you add up their cost of administration plus their fraud, and they have no cost of capital, and of course they don't try to make money, they try to lose money, their, their overhead is about 26, 27 percent. The private insurance market, what we should be trying to fix the things that are wrong with that, not the fact that their total costs, including their profit, is 19.1 percent. We ought to fix the real problems. Making sure you can buy insurance anywhere you want to buy it. Making sure that pre-existing conditions don't keep you from being able to get insurance. Making sure your age doesn't keep you from being able to get insurance. Making sure that you never have a bankruptcy because you were sick and making sure you never lose your home because you're sick. Those are the things that we ought to be fixing rather than assuming that the government can do it. Uh, I'm reminded that I can't think and I, can't, I challenge anybody to give me a federal government program that is both efficient and effective. Some are effective. Very few are efficient, and none are effective and efficient. And so if we look at how we're doing a good job in helping our seniors with Medicare, but the costs and the fraud rate with it are atrocious. In Medicaid, we're not either efficient or effective. And so what we ought, the people ought to be asking the question, why don't, why don't we do this a different way rather than trust two systems that are not doing a great job right now? And governors, both Republicans and Democrats, met this past weekend and, and, said, and said that we're very worried about the impact this is going to have on their state budgets as uh, it's going to crush state budgets when these Medicaid issues go on to the states. Here's, the costs an important, here's an important fact. On Medicaid, this bill over the next 13 years will cost states $1.6 trillion. The Patient's Choice Act over the next 10 years will save them $962 billion. Now, which way, and, and everybody, and we cover more people, by the way, 
and everybody gets auto enrolled. So we don't have people missing out on a program that's for them. Which way should we go? One that saves us 900 billion or one that costs us 1.6 trillion? Uh, it, that's the lack of common sense in Washington. Yeah, and American families who balance their budget get it right every time. And they've got it figured mm -hmm. out. Yeah, I think through Twitter we have a question that came in specifically uh, for you, Tom. What's the status of your health care proposal? Did it make it into the bill out of committee? Uh, I like it. Yeah. Uh, our health care bill I offered as a complete substitute, myself and Richard Burr, Johnny Isaacson, and several of the others that were on the committee that are co-sponsors. We lost that bill 12-10 oh. on the vote in the committee. Now we have a video coming in. Um, I guess I'd be interested to know how health care reform is going to affect health care, U.S. health care workers um, more down, I guess, at a lower level. I'm a nurse, nurse practitioner, so I'm interested in how reimbursement would work. Well, nurse practitioner trying to uh, deal with patients First of all, we need, we, need, we need a lot more of them. Uh, one of the ways to get a lot more of them is to pay them better. Uh, one of the reasons we have a shortage of primary care physicians in this country is because there's a 350 percent payment differential between a primary care doctor and a super subspecialist. Uh, Medicare has mandated that. They're the ones that set the payment. When you get a, if your insurance company is paying for your primary care doctor, that rate is based on a percentage above Medicare. And so consequently, we've seen this maldistribution in primary care. So, what, And we're seeing the shortage of nurses as well. So what we have to do is have the market forces of saying, what do we need? The answer in the bill that's going through Congress is to give more money to doctors so they'll go there in terms of their educational costs, but nothing in terms of payment reform. So we have to have fundamental payment reform if, in fact, we want people to supply the needs where the demand is. And in Wyoming, I mean, rural communities, Oklahoma, we need nurse practitioners, physician assistants, you bet. doctors, and primary nurses, care. we need them all. That's so, right. Uh, we have an email that came in now. Let's see. Um, I keep hearing Obama say over and over again that it won't affect my family's health care plan that is already in place. How can that be true? In order to pay for this health care plan, won't my taxes go up? Won't it be harder for my insurance company to compete with the socialized plan? Uh, really, shouldn't we be more focused on controlling the outrageous cost of health care in general, even if you're insured, uh, by getting the government, lawyers, and HMOs out of it? That's I think she answered her own question. I think that's a great statement. I, 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 I align with it. Well, and if you, if you want to put, call us or write us, we want to hear from you, uh, email us, doctors at src.senate.gov, uh, youtube.com slash user slash Senate Doctor Show, facebook.com uh, slash Senate Doctor Show, and uh, twitter.com Senate Doctors. We love to hear from you. We now have a, a video from Wisconsin. I'd like to ask the senators why they feel the need to uh, affect a system that's worked so well in this country for so long. We don't have the money right now to be spending on experimental programs. They're already experimenting with all our money and it seems to me like they're out of money in this country. And uh, we appreciate the job you're doing for us in Washington, but uh, we're kind of tapped out in this country right now. We're sick of crises. Slow down. I think it's a well-expressed sentiment and it goes back to the fundamental. <clears throat> we can fix health care without raising anybody's taxes, without spending any more money. We, and we need to, and, and it's important, I think, for the, the viewers of this. One of the reasons we need to fix health care is because it affects our global competitiveness. The cost of health care in this company, country is too high for us to maintain an advantage into the future. And it's not that we don't have good health care, and it's not that we can't cover them, but we've got to make it competitive and we've got to get more value for the dollars that we're paying. And so the real answer, earlier question that we had from one of the viewers, is a competitive model in terms of, of, of squeezing down those prices. You know, the head of Safeway found uh, eight or nine different prices for colonoscopy within five miles of his headquarters in California. They ranged from $750 to $7,000, all of equal quality. Well, that's why transparency to patients what am I paying and what's the quality outcome? So if I get to decide to have the same quality at a lower price, why wouldn't I do that? And that's what we got to connect up, is if I can get it done at a lower price, I want to do that. And we're hearing from all around the country, and certainly I hear it at town meetings and visits in Wyoming, that uh, this country is, is facing a wall of debt. You know, yeah. we have the stimulus package where it's $100 million a day, just interest on the debt. Uh, so there's huge concerns there. Now we have a, a budget that's going to double the national debt in five years, triple it in ten. Grave concerns out there is just as he expressed. How are we going to afford this? A, a little peculiar number. This is a number of people have that I can't even get my head around it. If you take the 75-year projection, 
for federal employee retirement, for military retirement, for Medicare, for Medicaid, for government p pensions outside of that, for uh, Inland Waterway Trust Fund and everything else, it's $93 trillion. If you take that to every one of us, it's $363,000 a person. But it's not going to be applied to everyone. It's only going to be applied to our kids. So we now have laid, laid on our kids, the next two generations, about $500,000 worth of unfunded liabilities. We dare not push one more penny onto their back. And what we should be doing is about reducing. That's why getting health care right is so important, lowering the cost rather than raising the cost. I have a question from one uh, that came in through Twitter. Uh, Senate doctors, uh, has the government identified realistic, realistic savings in the system? Well, I don't think that the government has. I think several of the plans have. Uh, we can insure every Medicaid patient in this country with a private equivalent of Blue Cross, Blue Shield, or similar for 20% less than what the states are spending on Medicaid today. There's savings to you. That's, that's $960 billion, $970 billion a year uh, over 10 years for the states. Well, you extrapolate that out, that, that's a big amount of savings. So there's saving. The duplication of services. There's no question um, health IT will help us when, in fact, we can really talk to one another. So we will not duplicate uh, test that already, you may have seen them as an orthopedist, I may have been their primary care, I already had their thyroid, CBC, EKG done, and you don't know that, so you duplicate it again. There's no question we can do that. So there are some things that we can do in that regard, but most of the studies on that say it's not going to be near the savings everybody thinks it's going to be. Yeah. We have a video coming in now. How about for the people that can afford some level of health care insurance, how does that stay under control and not spiral costs that are spiraling costs out of control. And I guess lastly, um, how can we ensure that we can get quality care uh, at an affordable price for the common person? Well, I didn't hear the first part of his well, question. For people I, that can afford care, how can do we know? Or can, can, can afford uh -huh. care, how does it, and you know the Washington Times Today front page story, Mayo Clinic calls house plan bad medicine, Obama loses support on reform. Uh, the Mayo Clinic, where, where we look to see the highest quality, the best care, uh, and they're saying Says that it's, it's going to drive costs gonna, up. The, that the plans they're looking at voting on now in the, in, in the House are going to drive costs up and going to be bad for American families. And that says to me we need to take time, look at the bills, read the bills, and yeah. see what's their time. Well, and I'd like for them to come to our website, coburn.senate.gov, and look at 1099, uh, the Patient's Choice Act. I think you'll see the, the questions that we heard here today answered in a logical and common sense way. And maybe they ought to uh, contact their uh, senators and see if they might not look at it a little more closely as well. Well, that's what we want people all around the country to do. Be more informed. Visit with your uh, representatives and your senators. Uh, really take an active role because your, your life, your health, your family, this is such a personal thing for all of you. Uh, I want to thank you all uh, for joining us today with Senate doctors. Senator Coburn. Be with you again, John. This is terrific. We'll be back Thursday, Thursday afternoon, 4 o'clock right. Eastern Time. Uh, thank you very much for being with us on Senate Doctors.